Good morning, good morning. Turn around and say Merry Christmas to someone, please. Yeah, I heard a Happy New Year in the mud. The instructions were Merry Christmas. It's good to see all of you in the house, Lord. Thank you so much for being with us today. Just excited that uh, all of you are here with us, and we are looking for a wonderful, wonderful day. Um, I know the sermon series, Is It a Wonderful Life? I can just go ahead and tell you, and I can affirm it is a wonderful life if we know Jesus. So we're so thankful you're with us today. We're looking for a wonderful time in the Lord. Um, thank you again for being with us. Um, i got to make a couple of announcements before we get started. Uh, we, we started our, our new series on uh, Wednesday nights. It's everything you need, and I really, I really enjoyed the lesson. If, uh, if you were not here in person, I hope you can go back and listen to it uh, with us. It's really, we're just taking a look at 2 Peter chapter 1, uh, verses 3 through 11. We're just going to spend some time, really 10 weeks, on those few verses and unpack those and find out how we can really appropriate the, the promises of God. So um, if you really want to know how can I embrace these promises, how can I stand on them, this is a study you need to be a part of. And um, if you can't be with us in person, please be with us online. This coming week, Brother Chris will be teaching. He always does a wonderful job. You'll enjoy him. And, um, and then we're going to take a little break on the 22nd. There will be no service on Wednesday night. And then we'll come back on the 29th, and then there'll be a prayer and praise service. And I'm really leaning on uh, the team behind me to, to lead that. And uh, you just pray for them. They, they don't know they have to lead it just yet, but I know they'll do a good job with it. I can hear them smiling behind me right now, as a matter of fact. Probably pointing fingers at me, maybe. It's still a wonderful life. Amen. No, it's going to be a great night. We just want to meet for as we close out the year and start the new year, just for a time of prayer and, and to praise our God together. And uh, I know it's going to be a wonderful night. So I'd love for you to be a part of it. And then the, we'll come back the first week of January and start that study back up the third week. Um, or I mean, maybe January the third or so. But we'll start that third chapter then. Uh, Tuesday morning classes are still meeting. They're enjoying themselves. They're ministering. And so great things are happening here at the Benson Church. I want to make you welcome. In any way we can help you, we'll be glad to. Um, if you do not receive emails from me, um, I'm not the person you want to ask about that. Um, I, I'm not a tech person. I'm going to say CPJ or CCHA, and they could help you uh, get connected with me so I could email you. But the reason I asked that, on Wednesday night, I gave out this sheet, um, but I also emailed it. And it's got several different scriptures that we're going to embrace as we start the new year. We typically have a, a fast at the beginning of the year, a 21-day fast. And, and this year it's going to be um, he's the one. He's the one that we seek, speaking about Jesus. He's the one that we share, and he's the one that we serve. And so when we get ready to start that fast, uh, January the 1st to the 21st, I've got some scripture references I think that will help guide us as we do that. On those topics. So if you didn't get one of those, uh, it's, it's not too late. You know, we still got some time to go before it's January the 1st. But I have emailed them, and we gave hard copies on Wednesday. And I can give some more out this Wednesday as well. Don't have them with me this morning, but we can get you one, okay? We want to go to the Lord in prayer. Several needs that we want to continue to mention with our church family. Um, Tony Risk dealing with cancer. Let's continue to lift him up. Uh, Melissa Q recovering from surgery. Miss Sherry Goodwin is out of the hospital. Uh, Mr. Aaron Spain is out, and he's typically with us in our second service. Ms. Rachel Stanley is currently in the uh, rehab uh, part of Cape Fear Med now, so continue to pray for her. Um, Bobby Joe Fletcher, Cameron Price, Michael Lee is still in the Greenville Hospital. Uh, Dale Parker came through his surgery. We want to continue to pray for him. Uh, Brittany Milam came through hers. Ms. Shirley Rigsby, um, Emily Presley and her baby. Uh, Carrie Edwards, uh, Ms. Pete Garcia. Mr. Pete started coming in our second service. He's going through chemo treatments. Uh, also, some upcoming um, surgeries or procedures. Uh, Pastor Kelvin Blackman, let's lift him up. And two new ones this week, uh, Harold Murray and Larry uh, Coville. Both need our prayers, okay? So why don't we stand together and pray for these needs and whatever else you may have this morning. And let's make the Lord welcome in this place today. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we do love you. 
and we praise you. We're so honored to be able to be in your house, dear God, and be with your people. Lord God, it's just a great season to be in the house of God, the time and the season that we remember our son, your son, our Savior came uh, to, to die for our sins. And we celebrate that, and we join this season together to look forward to his second advent when he's coming back to take us home, to be with you, dear God. But Lord God, while we're here, we're here to worship you. We're here to love on you, dear God, and we pray that you'll be welcome in this place today. We pray for your hand and your anointing upon everything that we say and everything that we do. Lord God, we pray that you'll touch these singers and these musicians and, and they'll lead us into your very presence, dear God, that every born-again Christian would sense you today in a very real and a very personal way that we cannot leave this place the same as we came in. Dear God, we determined not to do that. We know that in your presence is the fullness of joy. And that's what we want in this place today, dear God. And we pray for all the needs that have been mentioned, that have been spoken. Dear God, there's a lot of unspoken requests all over this place. You alone know the needs of the people that came in here today. You know their struggles that they've overcome just to get here, the sacrifices they made to be here, dear God. And I pray that you'll smile upon their efforts today. And I pray that you'll comfort them where they're weak today and strengthen them, dear God. Oh, God, most of all, if there's any who are unsaved here with us or unsaved who are listening online, that the day will be the day that they surrender to you and give their life to you. And, Lord, we'll give you praise. We'll give you honor and glory. For it's in the name of your Son, Jesus, we pray. And we ask these things. And let everyone say amen. 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 It's great to see you. Please turn to make someone welcome in the house of God today. Thank you for being with us. to be joyful about today that we serve a risen Savior. Amen. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for always being with us. But you have never known. 
waiting for change to come, knowing the battle's won, for you have never failed me Oh, no. 
softly you know uh, my responsibility is your spiritual growth as your pastor and I don't want to make you dwell too far but I want you just everyone in this place to think about the worst thing that's come to you over the last year or maybe two years and here's my challenge to you if you felt like you were all alone during that time 
I want you to find your place at this altar because someone's going to pray with you. But those of you who can look back and say, as bad as it was, I know God was with me. I want to challenge you to worship for just another minute or two and let him know that you know he was with you. Because your praise and your worship in this place is going to help someone else. Some of you have gone through some things, and had it not been for God, you wouldn't have made it. But you know today God brought me through it. As we sing just a little bit more of that, I just ask you, praise him and worship him and let him know I know it was you that brought me through. Yours is different from your neighbor's, but nonetheless, God brought you through. Think about it. If you need to be at the altar, it's open. If you need to sit and praise Him, do that. But let Him know how faithful He is today. Every step we are breathing in Your praise. Evermore we'll be breathing out Your praise. You are faithful, God. You are faithful. You are faithful. Cause 
the God of the mountain. He is the God of the valley. And there's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again. thank you today knowing that there is nothing better than the risen Savior the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords Lord you can turn our graves into gardens and you can turn our morning into dancing today so Lord I just pray that you open up our hearts and our minds as your Holy Spirit continues to be in your house minister to us as only you can and Lord just give us the freedom that may we know we have in you and the faith continue day by day in your word I pray Amen and amen. You may be seated and just welcome somebody beside you again to the house of the Lord this morning. Where are you two going on this here now, honeymoon? Where are we going? Look at this. There's the kitty, Ernie. Here, come on. Count her, Mary. <laughs> Don't look now, but there's something funny going on over there at the bank, George. I've never really seen one, but that's got all the earmarks of being a run. Uh, make yourself at home. George, can I see you a minute? Uh, 
Why did you call? Well, I just did, but they said you left. This is a pickle, George. This is a pickle. All right, now, what happened? How did it start? Well, how does a thing like this ever start? All I know is the bank called our loan. When? About an hour ago, I handled over all, all our cash. All of it? Every cent of it, and still was less than we owed them. Holy mackerel! And then I got scared, George, and closed the doors. I... I... Was, I, I... The whole town's gone crazy. Yeah, hello? hello? George, it's Potter. Hello? George, there is a rumor around town that you've closed your doors. Is that true? But, George, I've got my money here. Did he guarantee this place? Well, no, Charlie. I didn't even ask him. We don't need Potter over here. And I'll take mine now. No, but you're... You're, you're, you're thinking of this place all wrong, as if I had the money back in a safe. I, the, the money's not here. Well, your money's in Joe's house. That's right next to yours. And in the Kennedy house, and Mrs. Maitland's house, and, and a hundred others. Uh, you're lending them the money to build, and then they're going to pay it back to you as best they can. Now, what are you going to do, foreclose on them? I got $242 in here, and $242 isn't going to break anybody. Okay, Tom. All right. Here you are, you sign this, you get your money in 60 days. For 60 days? Well, now, that's what you agreed to when you bought your shares. Tom, 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 did you get your money? No. Well, I did. Old man Potter will pay 50 cents on the dollar for every share you got. 50, 50 cents on the dollar? Yes, cash. Well, what do you say? No, Tom, you have to stick to your original agreement. Now, give us 60 days on this. Okay, man. Randall. Are you going to Potter's? Better to get half than nothing. Tom! Tom! Randall, now, Randall, wait. Now, wait. Can't you understand what's happening here? Don't you see what's happening? Potter isn't selling, Potter's buying. And why? Because we're panicky and he's not. That's why. He's picking up some bargain. Now, we, we can get through this thing, all right. We, we've got to stick together, though. We've got to have faith in each other. But my husband hasn't worked in over a year, and I need money. How am I going to live until the bank opens? I got Dr. Bills to pay. I need cash. I can't I keep my kids on faith. I've got to have... How much do you need? Hey! I got $2,000. Here's $2,000. This will tie us over to the bank reopens. All right, Tom, how much do you need? $242. No, Tom, just enough to tide you over until the bank reopens. I'll take $242. There you are. That'll close my account. Your account's still here. That's a loan. Okay. All right, Ed. Well, I got $300 here, George. All right, now, Ed, what will it take until the bank opens? What, what do you need? Well, I, I suppose... Twenty dollars? Twenty dollars. Now you're talking. All right. Thanks, Ed. That's fine. All right. Now, Miss Thompson, how much do you want? But it's your own money, now, George. Now, don't mind about that. How much do you well, want now? I can get along with twenty, all right. Twenty dollars. Fine. And I'll sign yeah, the papers. Yeah. You don't have to sign anything. I know. You, you pay when you can. That's okay. All right, Miss Davis? Well, could I have seventeen fifty? <laughs> That's your heart. Of course you can have it. You got fifty cents? <laughs> Those of you who've watched a movie, It's a Wonderful Life, you'd recognize that scene. That's the, um, that's the bank run scene. And you know what happened. Um, they were about to go on their honeymoon. They had planned for their honeymoon. They had prepared for their honeymoon. But then all of a sudden, it got disrupted. Uh, the bank run. I've, I've never seen one of those or experienced one of those. But from my understanding, that's when all the people decide they want to take their money out of the bank. And they all decide they want to do it at the same time. And that can create some problems for the bank, and it created a problem for George because he had a building and a loan business, and so therefore people were coming to him to try to get his money, and it disrupted their plans. It disrupted their, their wedding plans. It disrupted their future. It disrupted um, their financial plans because they were going to take the money they had, and they were going to give it to someone else. And so when you see something like that in that movie, you have to ask the question, if life can be disrupted, when the plans that we had, the things that we were preparing for, are not going like we thought they would, is it really a wonderful life? Those of you who have been part of our, our recent discipleship study, when your world falls apart, you know about the word disruptions. We, we've seen, we've defined disruptive moments. Let me say this for those of you who are not being with me. Those are unanticipated, unplanned, unwanted events that come in our life. Let me say that again. We don't anticipate them. We don't plan them. We don't want them. And they come in our life at a time that's really interesting. It's at a time when we think everything is moving in the direction we thought it should go. 
Like, for example, maybe you're transitioning from high school to college or from college to career, and everything is looking great for your future, and then life is disrupted. Or maybe you're transitioning from from your college to your career and you're about to start a family and life is disrupted. Maybe you're getting ready for the retirement years and you say, I'm just going to coast into the future here and life is disrupted. Here's what can disrupt our life. Sickness from, for your sickness or maybe the sickness of a family member. I'm not talking about a head cold or a cough. We're talking about a terminal illness. It disrupts our life. We're not looking for that. And it turns our world upside down. Maybe your, uh, your position in life changes and now you're having to care for people you thought you would never have to care for. It disrupts your life. You didn't think you'd ever have to do something like this. Sometimes it's a, um, uh, the, the crisis that can be going on in the world around us disrupts our life. Sometimes it's the death of a family member or a close friend. It disrupts our life. The the point is, things will come up when we're not looking for them. And they're they're coming up. Listen good here. We we think life is just like we want to be. I mean, we've got everything in order. We've got everything planned. And we're so organized. It's going just like we want to go. We can't ask for anything better. And then all of a sudden, there is a disruption. And it changes everything. And it makes us ask, is life really that wonderful? If sickness can come to someone like you or me and and we think we got it together, why is it wonderful? If if someone is struggling like this, why is it so wonderful? If it's so wonderful, why did I lose my dad? Or why did I lose my mom? Or why did I lose a child or a parent? Why is it so wonderful when there's so many disruptions? When I look at the, the Christmas story, and the birth of Jesus, I think if anyone had a disruptive moment, I think it was Joseph. I really do. I mean, think about it. He had a wonderful life plan with a young girl named Mary. Wedding plans. Looking for a great, wonderful future together. And then he finds out she's pregnant. And he knows there's no way this can be my child. I call that a disruptive moment. He wasn't ready for this. He wasn't preparing for this. He wasn't, really didn't want this. But nonetheless, it's in his life. What happens when we have these disruptive moments? A couple of things I want you to take away from Matthew 1 and 20 today. If you have your Bibles, let's look there together. Matthew 1 and 20. And the Bible says this in reference to Joseph. While he thought on these things. Behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. Disruptive moments. What do we need to learn about them? I'm going to say one thing. When disruptive moments come, they can lead us to ponder. Okay? They can lead us to to ponder. The Bible says this, while he thought on these things. And the word thought there just simply means to uh, bring to our mind. It's when we just roll ideals around in our mind. It's when we just revolve thoughts and we reflect and we process. That's that's all it means. It means to consider something. In, In Greek, it actually says to ponder. Now, if you're a young person here today, you've probably never heard the word ponder. Okay? But let let me explain to you. It's a real simple word. Back when I was a young boy, if you were to ask an older person a question, chances are they would respond this way, I don't know just yet, let me ponder about it. Have you ever heard that before? Let let me, in other words, I can't give you an answer right now, I've got to ponder about this thing. I'm afraid I'll make a mistake if I answer right now, let me go and ponder for a while. Uh, I don't know what we're going to do about it. I don't know how we're going to have I've just got to, and all they're saying is I just need to think through it. 
I just need to, all right, today we're going to say, I've got to process this. And that's what Joseph was doing. He was, he was met with this disruptive moment, and he had to ponder about it. He had to think about it for a while. And that's what disruptive moments do. They, they get us to a point where we have no other choice, but we've got to sit down and we've got to think a while a little bit. And, and no doubt Joseph had to think or he had to ponder uh, about the situation itself. I mean, the Bible says they were, they were engaged to one another. And, and we've got to understand, engagement for Mary and Joseph was a lot more serious than an engagement would be for us today. Because uh, by, all, you know, by all meaning, they were, they were considered husband and wife. That the man and the woman would continue to live with their parents, maybe even up for a year. But they were called husband and they were called wife. And they were considered to be married. And it was so serious that it could only be broken by a written divorce. I mean, that's how you have to get out of it. It was a serious thing. And so during those months or up to a year when they were separated from one another, it was to show how faithful they were to one another. Well, it was during this time, listen carefully, it was during this time when Mary decided to go stay with her cousin Elizabeth. And she was away for three months. And when she came back, the Bible says in the King James, she was found with child. Translation, she's pregnant. Okay? And Joseph has got to ponder because this has just disrupted his life. Listen, she's been gone for three months. And she comes back and she's with child. I was not on the trip with her. And she's come back and she's with child. We've never had an intimate moment together. We've never had an intimate encounter. And now she's with child. This woman is pregnant and there's no way in the world this child is mine. It has just disrupted our lives. Our plans have been changed. Our future has been changed. And he's got to sit back and think about how did this happen? Or maybe he's thinking, why did this happen? Or, or what could have caused this? to happen what could I have done wrong why would she have done this to me who was the man that has caused this even he's got to process all these things he's got to think about the situation but he also has to think about a solution he's thinking back now and yet you can just imagine what will people say about this I mean I wasn't with her what are they going to say about us and he's going to be thinking things like what can I do Here's the question. What are my options? By law, according to Deuteronomy, option one, I can bring her before all the people. I can expose her unfaithfulness. I can let everyone know that she has sinned and she's committed adultery. And they'll take her out and they will stone her and she will die. That, that's the Bible. Option one. Here's option two. I can do that, but I still love her. I know I'm not the baby's daddy, but I still love her. She was not faithful to me, but I still love her. I don't want to scandalize her name any longer. I don't want to cause reproach upon her. Option two, according to Deuteronomy, is this. I can give her a written divorcement. I'll just do it that way. I'll put her away privately. No one has to know any more about it. Uh, we'll just be very discreet about it. She'll go her way. I'll go my way. I'll take the loss. I'll take the hurt. And this is what he's pondering. This is what he's thinking about. What can I do? This is my situation. What's my solution? And probably some of us get there, maybe even today. And what can I do? Can I do? When a disruptive moment comes to our life, when, whether it's a sickness or whether it's something going on with our career or maybe it's the death of a family member, we're thinking, what can I do now? How can I make this better? How can I fix this situation? I wonder today if anyone really understands what I'm saying. Because, because you can see someone struggling so hard and, and it's breaking your heart, someone that you care about, and you're thinking, what can I do? do to help how can I keep them from struggling you know sometimes you see someone in sin and it breaks your heart to see how they're destroying their lives and how they're just abusing their body and, and everything they're involved and you're thinking what can I do to bring them out of sin how can I how can I just save them what can I do about this maybe you just see someone with the situations of life and, and they're searching for answers and it breaks your heart to see what they're going through with and you might be a parent or you might be a, a, a husband or a wife 
off and, and you want to make it better, but no amount of love that you have is bringing them out of the situation and it's tearing you apart because your life is disruptive and you're wondering, what can I do to make it better? I'm just telling you today, a disruptive moment will cause you to ponder. It'll cause you to think. It'll cause you to get all by yourself and all kind of ideas will be going on in your mind. What can I do to make this better for them? That's what we ask ourselves sometimes. And we get there. What can I do? You see the hurt in their eyes. You see the pain. You hear it in their voices. And you want so much to make it better. And you're just here thinking it not. What can I do? And here's the good news. Disruptive moments can cause us to ponder. But they can also lead us to peace. Yeah. And you're thinking, Pastor Mark, I don't know. Yes, trust me. They can this is what the angel told Joseph. He says, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife. For that which is conceived of her is of the Holy Ghost. Now, do you hear what he's saying? The angel is saying, don't be afraid to take her as your wife. Don't fear to do this anymore. Let me preach it this way. And I don't want to stretch you too far, but this is what came to me. What if the angel is just telling Joseph in a, in a nice way, listen, I want you to get up in the morning and I want you to carry on with your life. Don't you let this disruptive moment define you. Don't you allow this disruptive moment to keep you in this valley. Don't you allow this disruptive moment to turn your world upside down. You will get up in the morning by faith and you will put your foot on the floor and you will walk another step. I want you to get up in the midst of this disruption and carry on with life. You're going to get up and you're going to still marry that little girl. You're going to get up and still go on with your wedding. She's still a good girl. There's nothing wrong with her. She's still a virgin by the word of God. And I'm telling you, it's okay for you to get up and go on with your life. And the Bible says this in the end of this chapter, that when he woke up from his dream, he aroused from his sleep, the King James says, and he took unto him Mary, his wife, and knew her not in an intimate way. He didn't know her until Jesus was born. What do you mean? He got up. And he carried on with love. He was at peace with the situation. He couldn't change the disruption. Yes, she's pregnant. And no, I did not father that child. But I've got a peace that I can keep going with my life. I've come to a settled peace that I'm going to get up and I'm going to carry on. Am I making any kind of sense to anybody? you got to make that applicable to you today. Because I don't know what has disrupted your life. But I'm telling you, with God's grace and God's strength and God's help, you can get up and life can still go on. Life doesn't end with the sickness. And life doesn't end with the struggles. Life doesn't even end with the death. We somehow by faith realize, God, you've left me here. And I got to get up and I got to keep going. I'm not trying to be insistent to anything that's going on in your life. But I'm telling you, you don't have to live in the disruption any longer. You can get up up my faith and have peace that God's going to carry me through and he's going to see me through. Lord, it just comes down to a matter of having peace with God about it. Let me tell you something about peace. Peace can be associated with harmony. It can be associated with being satisfied. It's associated with being content. And when it's from God, it is so deep within our spirit Listen to me today. Some of you know what I'm talking about today. I, the, the disruption is there. But within you, there is something else. Listen, he has got you so settled and so calm that you walk right in the midst of the disruption. It doesn't stop you. He's giving you so much strength and so much confidence that you still get up and you preach another Sunday. You teach another lesson. You sing another song. You still witness to people. You get up and you carry on with life. It's a picture of peace. Someone was asked to draw that one time. Two artists. And one of them painted this picture. It was a beautiful lake. Calm waters. Surrounded by trees. There was a little cottage. And the sun was setting. It was just really just a perfect rest. And another guy painted his. And it was a wild and violent storm. And in the midst of it all, there was a tremendous waterfall. 
and water's just rolling down and the water's foaming up and the clouds are dark and they're black and they're heavy. And you see that violence and you say, how can this be peace? But, but then in the picture, there's a rock. And in the cleft of the rock, there's a little bird perched, singing. The storm is all around him, but the bird is within the rock. He's found shelter in the rock. He's found shelter and refuge from the storm. Regardless of the disruption that's going on around him, he's found peace. That's what peace is. It passes all understanding. But listen, I want you to know today, disruptions are very real in life. And disruptions will come in life. But in the midst of all of that disruption, there is still a place with God that you can find. And it passes all understanding. Your family may not understand it. Your friends may not understand it. People around you may not understand it. But it's something going on with you and God. And it's giving you a peace. It's settled you in your heart. And somehow, some way, you know, everything's going to be all right. I can't explain it. I can't describe it. But within my heart, I know it's going to be okay. That's a peace that only God can give. How do you get there, Pastor? Because I don't see it. I haven't felt it. I don't experience it. How can we experience that kind of peace? How can we really be settled? Sister Heather's helped me out with something. I want you to get down. Just a little phrase. Here it is. To know God is to know peace. Look at the wording carefully. Know, K-N-O-W. You've really got to know Him if you're going to know that kind of peace. I'm going to give you some takeaways from this verse here. And I'm, I'm, just, I'm not going to preach this. I just want to highlight a few things. If you're a note taker, I think this is powerful to get though, okay? Some things I think you could learn from jo How did Joseph get up from that dream and go ahead and marry this woman? There's about five things if you want to write them down. Just, just, just application, that's all. You ready? Preaching's almost finished. Here they are. One is this. You need to know your position with God. Know your position with God. The reason I say that, the Bible says, when the angel spoke to Joseph, isn't it interesting what he said? He said, Joseph, thou son of David. Look how personal that is. He didn't just say Joseph. He said Joseph, son of David. And you do the research, you find out that it was through the line of David that the prophecy of Jesus was going to come. So you're not just any Joseph. You're that Joseph. You didn't just come from any line. You came from that line. The point is this. We need to know the relationship we've got with God. We really need to know that because if we know that God is our Heavenly Father, that means that we're His children. And let me tell you something. I don't know how it works at your house, but my children can come to me for just about anything they want. I may not give them everything because I feel like I know what they need, but they can come to me at any time. They can call me at any time. I'll leave things for my children. I'll interrupt my life for my children because that's the relate. And God loves us so much more. He's a much better father than I am. And, and let me tell you something, when I'm in his graces and I know in my relationship with him, I'm going to tell you something, there's nothing he won't keep from me. We need to know Amen. our relationship with God. A second one is this. We need to know the power of God. Yeah. Notice what he says here. Don't be afraid to take this woman as your wife because that that is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. This is what God is saying. This is the power of God. There was no man involved in this situation. This was supernatural. This, man, this is, man, this is the immaculate conception. This did not happen through man and woman. This happened through God. And there was nothing physical about God with it either. The Spirit of God overshadowed this woman, and she is with child. The point I'm making is this. If we really want to know peace, if we know our place or our position with God, we need to know the power of God. We just sang about it earlier. There is nothing in the will of God that he can't do. If it's the will of God, he can do anything. God can heal the sick. If God wants to, he can raise the dead. God can restore blinded eyes. He can restore death. I'm going to tell you, there's nothing God can't do. And by faith, we got to realize my God has all power. He spoke this world into existence. So I believe he can do anything if he wants to do it. We have to know the power of God. Let me give you a third one here. I don't want to preach these, but listen to me. The third one is this. I think we need to know how to, how to pray to God. And this is going to be a little stretch here. Look, Joseph, he went to sleep pondering these things. 
And the angel came to him. Now, I could be wrong, and if I'm stretching it too far, just forgive me. But I want to believe he had to talk to God about this at some point. The Bible says he was a just man. That's what it says in the King James. He was a upright man. He's a man that knew God. He came from a godly line. So don't you know if he's having a problem, he's going to talk to God about it? Here's the point. If we ever want to know peace, God is a good place to start. You can talk to anybody you want to, but if you're not talking to God, you're really talking to the wrong people. You can come to my office. I'll try my best to counsel with you, but I suggest you talk with God first, okay? I, I don't mind it. It won't cost you a dime, but just talk to God. He knows so much more than I know, and I'll venture to say he knows more than the people beside you know. Just talk to him every now and then. God's a good God, and he wants to hear you talk with him. He invites you to talk to him. He says, come volunteer to the throne of grace that you may obtain mercy and find grace to help in your time of need. I'm just saying prayer is a good place to start if you want to find peace. Got to move on. There's a, there's a fourth one here. I think we need to know the presence of God. I really do. The Bible says this, when, when he was sleeping, the angel of the Lord, it won't just some, it was, a, it was God's angel. God's presence was right there with this man. If you don't know what the presence of God's like, Man, we're living beneath our privilege is bad. I'm going to tell you something. There is a real presence of God. I'm not talking about just getting caught up in the emotions. I'm telling you, there is a very real presence of God. You need some time, if you're going through a disruptive moment, is to get along with the God that you know and just begin to talk with him in prayer. And after a while, you'll begin to sense his presence in a very real way. You may not be able to explain it to people, but I'm going to tell you, when you get up, you will be different than what you went in. But you've got to be able to get in his presence. There needs to be a very real encounter with God. Another one is this. This is the last one. It's the promises of God. If you were to read the rest of this story, he tells her this. He says, this is that that was spoken by the prophet. Amen. I think that's pretty much the next couple of verses. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bring forth a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, which is God with us. You know what that is? That's just a promise from the word of God. And sometimes, folks, that's all we've got to stand on. Sometimes we just got to take the word of God at face value and say, God, this is what you said. I've got to bring this up for you who were here Wednesday. Forgive me for being repetitive, but it's too good to pass up at this moment. You know, we learned something about the promises of God. Oftentimes I quote to you, there are yes and amen in Jesus Christ. But Wednesday night we learned that there's another twist on that. It's actually saying when you look at a promise of God, you're asking God, God, did you promise this? And God says yes, and our response is amen. Let, let me, and this is what Joseph would have said. Joseph would have said, God, did you promise that a virgin was going to have a son? And God said, yes, I promise it. And Joseph says, amen. I'm at peace with it. I'm going to get up and I'm going to go ahead because your promises are yes, and they're amen. They're already settled, and I'm going to keep on going. Oh, yeah. To know God is to know peace. Amen. To know God is to know peace. And you have to, listen, know your place with God. Know how to pray to God. Know, know the presence of God. Know the promises of God. Know the power of God. I think those are the five I mentioned here. But on the flip side of that, know God means no peace. Know God. Listen to me good. You're here in person. You're watching online. If you... Do not know God. You will never know peace. I don't want to be disrespectful. There's not enough money in the world that can bring peace if you don't know God. Listen to me. I love you. I love you enough to tell you this. There's not enough uh, homes in the mountains or on the coast or in another country that can bring peace. There's not enough vehicles we can drive motorcycles we could own, horses we could, whatever your hobby may be, okay? There's not enough state football championships Pastor Mark could have ever gotten that would bring peace without God. And it's the same way in your life today. So I don't know what's disrupted your life, but I just conclude by asking you, do you know God? Do you know God? If you know God, he'll bring you from that, okay? I'm not saying it will always go away. Because in the morning, 
When Joseph got up, he got up with peace, but Mary was still pregnant. Okay? In the morning, when you wake up, he or she might still have cancer. The difference is now you've got peace about it. You wake up in the morning, the dead may not rise unless it's rapture. But you still got peace. I'm not being disrespectful. Hear me well today. Some situations, some that they may not change. But what has changed is me and what has changed is you. Will you bow your heads and close your eyes? Father, we love you and we praise you. We thank you for your mighty and your great blessings, dear God. We thank you for those with us today who know you as Savior, who are in a relationship with you. Dear God, who embrace your promises, who love to encounter your presence. Dear God, who experience your power in their life. We thank you for all of that today. But there's a chance, dear God, some are listening. And they're in a disruptive moment. And unfortunately, they don't know you. Would you speak today so clearly that they can't doubt? Friends, while heads are bowed and eyes are closed, if you're here today, and the question is very simple, if you don't know God, would you like to? Would you like to? Would you like to meet him today? If so, I want you to get up from your seats and come here. Someone will meet you right here at this altar. If you're here and you're not in a relationship with him, you can be when you leave this place. I'm going to close out in just a moment. Brother Chris is going to come and he's going to just pray a, a prayer of peace over your disruptive moments. But first of all, I got to give this invitation. If you're here and you don't know God, may I please pray with you? Yes, I am begging. May I please pray with you? Listen to me, friend, while your heads are bowed, you will never know peace. And you're thinking, well, if I can just get to the doctor, I'll know it. No, that's not going to help. Well, if COVID would just go away, I would, no, that's not going to help. You hear me? If you're getting uncomfortable right now, it may be that the relationship with you and God is just not where it needs to be. And if that's you, please get up and let me pray with you. Come on. Make it right today with God. Make it right today. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to this back door. And if you want to talk to me privately, I'll be right there. I'll go to a room in this church. We'll pray together. Some others can pray with you as well. Brother Chris is coming to pray this prayer of peace. But if you need me, please call me. We love you in the Lord. God bless you all.